How's the Detroit Sports Podcast going? This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Hey everybody, this is Freddie Cohen of ESPN Radio. When I'm not talking about breaking news or breaking news on ESPN Radio, I'm always a fan and listen to the Detroit Sports Podcast, and so should you. So is there a podcast that people in Detroit should be talking about? Well, if you're going to play beer pong at 11 o'clock in the morning, you better be talking about the Detroit Sports Podcast Network, baby. I am the Doc. I'm so excited to be recording episode number 300 with my cousin, my pal. I would say this, a guy that if I was going to replace, I would say it would take me a long, 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 long time to recover because I've been recording with him for nearly six years. He's stooped down to my level, listened to my nonsense, put up with my BS, dealt with my ego. He still came back. And when I thought about this project, I said, okay, really, we're only going to have a couple tenants. One, no matter what, come hell or high water, when Thursday rolls around, you know Doc and Jock are going to bring a podcast. I picked a guy that I said, okay, who would I do this with? Who could I roll with, talk sports, talk some bullshit? He'll deal with my shenanigans. He'll roll with me no matter what, through thick and thin. And that's my cousin, Adam the Jock Strozinski. We are recording episode number 300, and it's lit. We're lit. We just played beer pong. And no matter what, when Doc wins a challenge, it's always a good day, baby. What up, cuz? I'm excited. I feel good. I feel relaxed. This is, I understand now, because I'm not really a big drinker. I understand why people do this. Just wake up. Have some eggs, have some sausages, wait in a half hour, watch the news, watch about the floods in Wayne County, and then just throw back some whiskey, baby. That's a great way to be, and I feel relaxed, and I'm looking forward to talking about the Lions, talking to Chris Burke from The Athletic about the draft and figuring all that mess out. But first and foremost, I'm so proud of this network. Uh, Every day presents something new, and for a guy like me to be able to broadcast to the masses is just a privilege, and thank you for being here with me. Absolutely. I don't, I don't know how to follow that up. Right. Well, you I, walked in the studio and there's like cups and you walk by for a second. I'm like, oh, the bit was ruined. Then you came back and you were like, we're playing beer pong, baby. We're playing beer pong at work, baby. I, I, I walked in. and <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for you to put it up. You're like, oh, I should probably edit that first part out. No, no, no. Yeah. Leave it all there. You're all cussing I, at your I, former boss. <laughs> I know. I walked in. I was I was really pissed off. Uh, my, my first boss tied me up. I wanted to be here no later than 1115. I ended up rolling in. I think it was like 11.25-ish. I know. So I was all pissed off at my boss, and I rolled by it. And I, I, out of the corner of my eye, I, I thought i seen cups. And I was like, see, I have something planned. Like, I was bitching the whole way. Like, this bitch. I can't believe this. I, oh, my God. I was so mad. I see the cups on the peripheral of my vision. And I was like, does he have something set up? What, what is going on? I set my, I, I set my clothes down so I can uh, change and, and go into the, to the radio station. And I come back, and I was like, Fuck yeah, we're playing beer pong. I can say fuck, right? It's a podcast. <laughs> I can say that, right? So I was like, fuck yeah, we're playing beer pong. This was great. So you had it all set up. You had uh, you had Bud Ice, which I'm not a huge fan of Bud products. I'm just going to go out there on the limb and go say Go Bud this. Ice. It's good. Bud Ice is so smooth. <laughs> I like to was like, Bud Ice? Like, what? That brought me back to the days of Michigan State, bro. <laughs> um, my buddy would come up, and I'd be like, are we having a Bud Ice night? And what we would do is we wouldn't mess around because I wasn't the kind of guy that wanted to sit there and conversate and sip beer. It was like Bud Ice night. So he'd get the Bud Ice. It comes in that uh, the sweet-ass glass, and I would throw them back. And it's so smooth that you could get a little bit inebriated and have a good time with it. So Bud Ice was my thing back in college, and I saw it when I was at the store, and I'm like, but I it just, you know, that feeling when you have a good memory it just brings a smile to your face. So now I'll always remember 300 for having a good time, being super relaxed and ready. Uh, and, you know, we're ready to let it rip. But and wait, you good. didn't stop there. We got a challenge. You got the crown royal. You got to get the crown, right? So we had mysterious cups placed throughout the beer pong challenge. And mind you, I started off hot. I hit the first cup. Hit the first one. I think I had you a little bit scared. You're like, oh, crap. Yeah. This wasn't how this was supposed to go. But then you ripped off, what, I want to say six straight cups. So as this podcast continues on, 
I'm going to get more and more and more hammered because it's all going to start to kick in here in a minute. This is great. Mind you, I've had nothing to eat all morning. I usually don't eat first thing in the morning. Just come in and do the podcast. We rip it off. We go. What was it? It was so it was it was it was five five drinks of uh, uh of Bud Ice, and then it was uh, a couple two, shots, heavy it, shots. It was two yeah. Crown Royal. It was two big shots of Crown Royal. So uh, by the time this is all said and done, I'm going to be hammered, guys. This is going to be a great podcast. I'm so excited to do this. I'm so excited to do this with you. The funny thing is. When all is said and done, and, and we, we, we actually make the video, uh, the movie, on, on how we did this podcast, a long time ago, guys, this whole thing almost didn't get off the ground. <laughs> there, there, there was like, honestly, there were like breaking points in the relationship of me and this guy where we almost just said, F it all, and, and just threw in the towel. I'm so glad that we made it to 300. Sponsors, great listeners, people that message Vito and I and say, look, we like you guys. We've been doing it similar to you. We started in the basement. Uh, we want to go to the next level, and we want to work with you guys. And the excitement that people have to say, I want to work with you guys, and they come in here, and usually the, uh, the secret, uh, what we do is we say, you know what? If you want to do a podcast, come in. Vito and I or Adam and I will talk to you, get uh, the announcement out of the way on a podcast. And so to see the excitement when people leave the studio, and they're like, yeah, they want us, and things like that, and it's like – it's a good feeling because cool. we worked hard on it, and that's what we wanted to do was to say, look, we're an alternative. We, we speak the truth. We're one of the only podcasts that really let it rip to that degree, and uh, we were one of the first to do it, and we were one of the first to build a network. Now you see them all over, and I, I like the fact I mean, that people said – We're half hammered on yeah, episode 300, so exactly. come on. You know, midday, having a good time with it because of the fact that, hey, we worked hard, and we, sh- we, we deserve to – uh, celebrate, you know, that'd be great. You know, if Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia, you know, lined up some cups and they had a bunch of wine and they were like, we got TJ Hawkinson. They throw back a sip of wine and they're like, ah, we feel good and uh, throw it back. But man, when you see the videos on DetroitLions.com, it's like, like we got Jelani Tavai. It's like yeah, quiet. And everybody's they were just, like, who? And, and it's weird because they pan into Matt. Get? Yeah, they pan into <laughs> Matt Patricia and he's kind of sitting there kind of like thinking, all right. I got a tight end. And it's like, it's, it's weird. It's no excitement. They kind of, then everyone claps. It's kind of like real professional. It is. Whereas if, if we ran the draft, it'd be like, fuck yeah, baby. We went to Iowa. We picked the best tight end. <laughs> Stick it to you, baby. Number eight. Ha ha, fans. Real quick. <laughs> so, so on draft night, I, and we, we discussed this last week. I, dr- I ended up driving out to Grand Rapids. And I got there in like an hour and 50 minutes. They were all stunned that I got there as quickly as I did. I was doing like 95 on the freeway. I was like, there is no way I'm missing the first round, right? So I get there and I, mind you, the guys I, who, who I do the radio show with, I've never met them. I just know who they are. We you interact. push buttons and you yeah. interject in their it, show. It, it's, I, we interact, we, we talk. Like We're all Facebook friends, so I guess that makes it official, right? It's Facebook official. But I've never... I've never met them. So I didn't really know what to expect or or who to expect or it, honestly this is what it must be like in 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 2019 uh going on a blind date with somebody or yeah. meeting somebody that you you end up meeting on on match.com or uh, what, what's the new one? Uh, Tinder. Yeah, that one. Like I sound like I'm never heard of like, it. Never I heard of it. I sound like I'm a hundred years old here. Never heard of it. Anyways, this is what it must be like meeting somebody off Tinder for the very first time. I walk in there and I see I see Jim Jim Costa. You guys go follow him. He's a good follow. He's extra salty. He's usually a little bit more angry than me. I walk in. I see him. I say hi, Jim. Whatever. He's like Strauss. We end up uh, embracing really quickly. As all this goes on, I get to meet Fongers and I get to meet uh, Drew and I meet uh, Brendan Riley. It was great. As the night continues along, I finally meet. I end up meeting uh, Jeff Risden, who he he is like he's like my love child. We are on the same wavelength. It, it's nuts. So I walk up to him, and this is how this is just how I am, right? And I walk up to him, and I'm like, Jeff, if the Detroit Lions take Josh Allen, Josh Allen was our guy. He was the guy that we both wanted. If the Detroit Lions take Josh Allen, we're taking off our clothes and we're running around here, at least in our underwear. And he was like, deal. And I was like, bet, my man, let's go. So as the draft's unfolding, there's video, and I'm waiting for this video to be put together and, and, and put out. And, and I put this all on uh, iHeart Radio uh, Grand Rapids promotional team because the one chick has video. I've seen the videos. It's multiple videos. There's like three of them. Nice. It, it shows me in all my Lions glory. 
with clothes on. It's great. It's a good time. It shows me as the Giants and Dave Gettleman in all his wisdom. You're like, what the heck is he doing? <laughs> to take, uh, take, take Daniel Jones. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be awesome. There's a legit chance here. Because I didn't expect the, the, the Jacksonville Jaguars to take Josh Allen. So as Gettleman's pick comes in and it comes across, and I'm like, all right, sweet, we got this. And you needed one team at the top of the draft to do something crazy and ridiculous. And the Oakland Raiders were that team. Thank you, Oakland, for taking Celan Farrell. He was the guy who I wanted the, the Detroit Lions to take earlier in the year. Uh, but I didn't expect him to go... Uh, fourth overall that blew my mind so you needed that to happen and you needed something crazy to happen with a QB situation and and that was Daniel Jones going to to the Giants (laughs) thank you Giants you're a bunch of idiots so all that takes place and I now have a wife beater on and I've got my pants unbuckled and they're basically off because I don't think the Jacksonville Jaguars are taking the best player available or the guy who can probably make the biggest impact on that team, at least initially, with Josh Allen. And, and I'm grabbing Risden, and, and Risden's grabbing me, and Risden has no no, no belt on. He's, he's, he's ready to go. Like, he is into this. He's not as into it as I am. Like, I am way into it. Uh, there's this video uh, of me collapsing to the floor in my, in my wife beater and my underwear, as, uh, and I have no shoes on, by the way, because I was ready to rip it all off. My insulin pump's disconnected because I'm a diabetic, and you know it's good for diabetics to drink at, I don't know, 11.30 <laughs> in the morning. But whatever. This is how we do things in real life. As me collapsing to the floor as Jacksonville makes that selection, and my heart gets crushed. And then the Detroit Lions come on the board, and they run. Like, they ran. They sprinted to the front to give... Uh, uh, um, Roger Goodell. Roger Goodell, the 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 the, the little card, and and he's like, I want T.J. Hawkinson's. It's T.J. all day. And T.J. Like, all day. I I at that point I go into a tirade of f bombs, swearing a lot, yelling a lot. It, it was absolutely banana boats, but it was it was a good time. Early on, everybody's reaction was like, No, I kind of uh, I told people like, you know, it kind of felt like. The blood left my body. I was like, not a tight end. Look, not because TJ Hawkinson's a bad player. Because it was in your penis? <laughs> no. Oh, you were Because I was excited. I was excited for the draft. I felt like maybe we're going to get Ed Oliver. Maybe yeah. we're going to trade back. Maybe we can uh, make a move and acquire another pick in this draft to get it to 10. But the reason why I think the fans, by and large, don't believe in a tight end at number 8 is the majority of Super Bowl teams don't do that. No. Gronkowski was picked in the 40s. <laughs> you know, he was the 42nd pick, I believe. It's a luxury pick, man. Yeah, it's just not a pick that most people will say is conducive for teams that are going to win the Super Bowl. But, you know, and I think that the Lions, they don't care. They have a situation now where they believe that, hey, if we got a guy that fits our uh, our system and he's going to be a good guy, classy guy, we're going to take him. And we're going to talk about that because it now reveals itself that the Lions are willing to take a player that fits their scheme more than talent. And Bob Quinn's come out and done some damage control on the radio, and he's talked about why he's taking these picks. But by and large, the fans of Detroit are very skeptical, as they should be. Now you got a handful of fans that are like, oh, it's all great, don't worry, he's going to be a great blocking tight end, and it's great. But remember, the value of number eight should be somebody that comes in and helps you right away. And maybe his stats won't be sexy, but I'm going to look at it like this. I'm going to evaluate the tight end position. I'm not going to evaluate Hawkinson just standalone. I'm going to evaluate Jesse James, Hawkinson, the other tight end they drafted, and if combined, the tight end unit can get 7 to 12 touchdowns, I think it'll be worthwhile. Or if we can get a running game that consistently produces 100 yards and you you see video of TJ Hawkinson, Jesse James, blowing the defenders away, then I'll be happy with it. But at 6 Everyone's skeptical. And then the pick that really is going to determine the success of Bob Quinn is the second-round pick. Everybody was just like, huh? They were floored. And the sell job for Jelani Tavai is, hey, he wasn't going to be there. He was our guy. He's a big, thick linebacker that we targeted. The Lions, Patriots even wanted him. And you know, That's the rumor. That's the rumor. That's but, the rumor. But that's the go-to now line for the Lions. Is, I, I really feel like that's lip gloss on a pig. But, I'm just saying. But it's a situation where the Lions are using that like, hey, the Patriots wanted them, so as a way to kind of shield everybody from all the complaints. But that's going to be the pick. That will be the definitive pick in the Bob Quinn era. If this guy turns out to be Tease Tabor, if he's going to struggle in the second round, big problems. But you know what? 
we have to root for a guy like that. It's kind of like the podcast. It's a guy that, you know, ESPN didn't even roll a clip. They were like, huh? Uh, they were scrambling. I can imagine the control room. They're like, find the video. Find the video. Who is this guy? They're lying. It's not Jelani. It's Javon. Me- don't mess this up. Who is it? Get, get the video. And they're all scrambling. And they're like, uh, time's up. Let's just move on. They had no video of the second round pick. The second and they just round, moved on. Well, when the second round pick came across on the radio, and I was streaming it with the iHeartRadio app in, in listening to ESPN 961, it, because I knew they were broadcasting it. I, w- I was driving back from my dad's house, right? I had, to drop, I had to go to my dad's house, grab a tool real quick, and and talk to my dad about some stuff that happened this Saturday. Shout out to uh, my new brother-in-law. He proposed to my sister. So my we, we finally were able to, to marry my sister off. Somebody said, I don't know, she said yes, but somebody wanted to do that. It was absolutely nuts. Whatever. Um, my sister, she, I love her. I'm just being a, being a dick. But I love my sister. She's great. Anyways. Uh, I had to go talk to my dad about some stuff that was going to happen this Saturday with all of that. And uh, I was listening, and, and I was like, what the shit? They took that guy? Like he was From a, Hawaii. He was a projected fifth-round pick. Like, From Hawaii. He was proje- like, I don't think anybody knew who this guy was, right? But I did because I'm a total – I'm a weirdo. I, I read all kinds of stuff, and everything that I had read about him said he was a fifth-round pick. When it came through, the guys who were who were sitting on the broadcast for ESPN Radio – started laughing they were cracking up they were dying they were like who what are are they for real they're taking this dude they had nothing to go to but laughter and then move on to the next guy that that's how messed up that was look he might be a really really good linebacker he really might and we're going to talk to Chris Burke here coming up here in a second. And he'll make sense of this. Uh, uh, he's going to try to. Yeah. Don't because, say he will. He's going to try to. No, he to. will try to make sense of it. And I think he'll uh, present us with the reasons why some of these picks happened. And I look forward to talking to Chris at The Athletic, a great writer, real good insight. He's there day in, day out with the Detroit Lions. If we were going to have a guest for episode 300, no better guest than Chris Burke of The Athletic. Let's get him on the line. But Look, for- r- r- Real quick story on Chris. Chris was the first guy when, when they said, hey, Adam, you can do a show on, on WDFN and you can have a guest. You can do whatever you want. He was the very first guest I had. Adam parlayed this to a radio gig. I can't <laughs> believe it. They didn't like throw him out. You know, one day your badge just goes beep beep rejected, and I know. they're like, "Why?" I'm waiting for you. That do a day. podcast with that idiot. I, I totally thought. I totally thought on uh, on Tuesday I was getting fired when 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 my boss came into this radio. Quick, studio. quick secret, okay? Because obviously now we have sponsors and we got uh, badges and we get to go to sporting events. It's real fun. But the best part of my day, honestly, is when uh, you throw out a question. And everybody will tag the Lions, Tigers, and Pistons, and Red Wings. And they'll just be like, da 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 And I'm like, yeah, they know. They know. I wormed my way in. So they know. They're like, who, what is this? They know who this guy Their is. Their social media intern is like, uh, we're getting this unusual kind of response. And we don't know where it's coming from. But they keep tagging this Detroit podcast. I don't understand. And it's like, man, the threads that we get into online on our Twitter page, it's been awesome. You guys supported it. And we get to, you know, the, the blessing of having great guests that want to talk to us that are like, sure, we'll come on. The best part, too, though, is, yeah, the, the interaction on Twitter. But the other part is, too, when you send out an email for a guest and you get no response. We still get that. That's the best part. Look, look, uh, the NFL Network, they're great. They respond in four minutes. Not available. Not available. Sorry. And uh, it's great. Others, they just will ignore you. Just completely silence. Like, okay, they'll respond to the important stuff like getting me on the email list and stuff like that. But when we want a guest... Radio silence. It's great. I, I like it, but I would just prefer a no. I mean, you don't have to come on, but just a simple, yeah, we're going to have to meet you first, moron, before you keep asking for all these guests. But hey, I'll keep sending them. Thousands and thousands of emails. They're free, so I'll keep doing it. I, <laughs> Why not, right? I'll keep sending them. I know. But just, I, I mean, know. literally, I think it, it, would, it would slow down if they just would reply, sorry, well, they're not available. Easier. Yeah, they're not right. available. It, it's like when you're, when you're trying to hook up with that girl, just like, just let they're me not know. Available. Just say no. But not I, available. I'm but not I, interested. But I do want to thank the two sponsors of episode 300, the Flick app. We are chatting there every single day. It's invite only. So at this time, if you want to join the Flick application, the newest Detroit sports headquarters, go over and uh, go over to our social media at Detroit Podcast. Find the invite link to the Detroit sports headquarters, and we're going to continue to grow it and uh, sign up new members. It's a great application uh, to further the conversation, great engagement going on when we watch wrestling, sporting events in town. Whenever news breaks, we'll go over there and continue the, the live chatting. It's really fun. And then the Motor City Pawnbrokers, 
Oh, man, I love the sponsors that took a chance and worked with the podcast. The Motor City Pawn Brokers are working hard every single day with great customer service to change the perception of pawn shops. Just go into one of their four locations. They will treat you with respect. You can go there and find any items that you're looking for at a greatly discounted price. For all information regarding the Motor City Pawn Brokers, go check out MotorCityPawnBrokers.com. And for all the sponsors that have worked with us, we greatly appreciate it. The Detroit Sports Podcast Network would have never taken off, and uh, it would not be as fun if we didn't have support from the listeners and the great sponsors that we work with. More are coming, and uh, thanks to the great work of Vito and the staff here, anybody that's contributed and worked with us, it does not go unnoticed. Even if we're a little bit uh, inebriated, we definitely love the work that we do with the great sponsors. Thanks, I'm everybody. Hammer, Joe. All right, let's get Chris Burke on the line from The Athletic. And here we are, episode 300. There was no other guest that we wanted to talk to after the Lions draft than Chris Burke from The Athletic. He's in the know covering the Detroit Lions day in, day out for The Athletic. Make sure you go and subscribe because even though other entities may not be around any longer, The Athletic does such great work in terms of setting the scene, behind the scenes stuff, great in-depth features. You really are missing out if you don't subscribe to The Athletic. Adam and I do, and we're happy to have relationships with the writers over there at The Athletic. And now joining us, Chris Burke. How are you today? Doing all right. Congrats on uh, number 300. That's a pretty impressive run there. We've been going strong since September of 2013, and uh, Adam and I have just had so much fun with this project and uh, being able to talk to guys like you. And after the NFL draft, I want to start with this, okay? Obviously, everybody now is kind of uh, looking around, evaluating what has happened with the Detroit Lions in their draft, their draft class in 2019. I'm curious as to your overall impression with the picks that the Lions selected, how do you think the Lions did overall in terms of who they added to this roster? <laughs> um, I mean, I guess the big question is whether or not you believe in what they're building there. I mean, I think that's really what it boils down to. If you trust Bob Quinn, if you trust what Matt Patricia is doing, then it looks like a really good draft because they got guys that are going to fill spots where they needed some help. You know, obviously Hawkinson fits a need. Uh, to buy maybe a little less so, but that you know they needed some help, some uh, playmaking at linebacker, maybe a little another guy with some versatility. Will Harris, they obviously lost Glover Quinn, you know Tavon Wilson, uh, probably not around very long. They had some openings there. I mean, they they plugged holes, and like I said, it sort of just boils down to if you buy into what they're building and what they say that they're trying to lay the foundation for, then this really does move them ahead. I mean, if you're trying to compare them to every single thing that's going around on around the rest of the league, uh, it looks a little shakier because I, I mean, I think you could make an argument that with almost every pick, I mean, maybe except for, I think if round four, round five value wise, they did pretty well, but almost every pick there was, you know, one or two other guys who said, well, why didn't they get that guy like that was the player they should have had there. So um, it's one of those drafts that I think is going to define sort of where things go for this organization because either it's going to be great and they're going to look like geniuses or you're going to be looking back on it and say, well, you know, we could have had Ed Oliver or we could have had Greedy Williams or whoever the guy is that jumps out for you. Now let's jump right in and look at the first pick that they took at number eight, TJ Hawkinson, because after the pick was made, you've seen all the videos of people disappointed. Even the fans that went to Allen Park that were part of the party were a little (laughs) bit skeptical, like, oh, no, not the tight end. And I think part of the reason is that people are a little bit skeptical of that pick is because of the fact that most teams that are competitive, that are upper echelon, that are considered great teams, don't take tight ends that high. But the Lions franchise has, you know, over a period of time now taken and been willing to risk taking tight ends that high. But in terms of what he brings to the table, he obviously fits a need. But what's your reaction to TJ Hawkinson being picked at number eight? I mean, I was a little surprised, but I, I, again, I think it makes sense for what they're doing. And then those guys that are coming off the board after him uh, at Oliver, I think has a chance to be a great NFL player, but if they're looking for very specific fits for this defense, he probably isn't in that category. Uh, you know, Bob Quinn said this week uh, on the radio, like they're looking for bigger physical linebackers, not necessarily sideline to sideline guys, which probably crosses Devin Bush off the list of people they were interested in. And I think you can argue that that's, I mean, I think you can argue the philosophy behind that when you look at how NFL offenses are moving and where the Lions have had trouble in that second level the last few years. But 
again, I mean, in terms of where their offense has been and where it needs to go, I, I think Hawkinson makes a ton of sense, especially compare or uh, when you combine him with Jesse James. Like Hawkinson's going to be your guy that creates some of those mismatches and lets you go uh, to two tight end sets a lot more and plays out in the slot some. So I think he's going to be a really good player. I mean, it's going to be tough for him because there's always going to be sort of that stigma of being a top 10 tight end, but also because even with a really good year for a rookie tight end, I mean, you're talking, if he gets to 500, 600 yards, that's a really good rookie tight end year. And I think the expectations for him are going to be uh, among the fan base, at least probably a lot higher than that. Chris, can you explain to me why I should be excited about Jelani Tavai? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think right. My the, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I yeah. There's sort of a gap for me between why I think he could be a good NFL player and why I think he's exciting right this second. I don't know that. I don't know that there's anything uh, that really jumps out to me as like that's a that that one really moves the needle. I mean, I think if you watch him. He is another guy that's going to fit sort of those buzzwords like the versatile, you know, they want to be multiple up front. He's someone that can be in the middle. He can play some coverage. He's really uh, interesting as an edge rusher, like a really an undersized edge rusher that you would blitz off the corner. So, yeah, I mean, I think he gives them some playmaking. I think he'll get to the quarterback and get in the backfield. The thing that, and I've mentioned this before, like the thing that jumps out for me if you're concerned is I don't know how he helps you compensate for where they were weak before it and where Jared Davis has his weaknesses. Like if he's, if Jared Davis is, we know he's an aggressive, he's a downhill guy. He's someone they want to use more as a pass rusher, I think moving forward. And Tavai has a game that's, it, it's not exactly the same, but it's, you know, the strengths are in similar areas. So, um, you know, by drafting him, you're putting a lot of pressure on the front to get home and on the secondary to cover because, I, again, I think the weakness in that linebacking core is going to be covering tight ends and running backs, and we've seen that be an issue for – I mean, that was a problem before Matt Patricia got there, and I think it still stands to be a problem. Chris, what has to happen for Amani Oruari to start opposite of Darius Slay? Uh, well, I think on the – you know, the – the sunniest side of things you see him step in and be kind of what he was uh, at the top end in college. You know, he's a, he's a tall, long uh, corner. He likes to play and press and, you know, he's someone that uh, finds the football makes plays on the ball. So I think if, if he steps in and has a really good preseason, really good camp and sort of shows that, I mean, I think to me, the biggest thing is just sort of the, I guess the foot speed, the recovery speed, like the, if he's, quick enough to stay with the NFL receivers through camp and the preseason. And uh, if they have joint practices, like he's certainly got a shot to be their number two guy. I mean, I think the reason Rashawn Melvin's there is because he's their kind of fallback. He's almost the way you'd view Nevin Lawson, you know, DJ Hayden, like those type of guys. Like if you have to start him, then you know that he can start in this league, but uh, you certainly can upgrade him. So I think uh, Oruwariye has a chance to be that really good player. It's a lot to ask a rookie cornerback, and especially a you know a fifth round rookie cornerback, to step in and be your starter. But I, I mean, I think if you look two and three years down the line, he makes a lot of sense as Darius Slay's you know the number two opposite Darius Slay. Whether he's that guy in week one or not, I'm not entirely sure. But I think I mentioned value wise that as everyone's pointed out that pretty clearly what I think was their best pick of the draft. Enjoying the conversation with Chris Burke. Now, Chris, I want to talk to you about general manager Bob Quinn, because after the draft, he's come out a little bit and talked to us, and it seems, and the way that Adam and I have interpreted it is, the Lions are willing to draft now, at this point in time, guys that will fit the scheme, guys that are going to be good guys in the room, leaders, things like that, maybe as opposed to pure talent. And I guess I just want to get your sense, your opinion. Are you a guy that says, well, maybe if there's a guy out there with more talent that you got to fit your scheme to the guy that you're drafting? Or are you maybe looking at Bob Quinn and saying, you know what? He is going to be absolutely strong in his convictions to go out there and find guys that fit the system for uh, head coach Matt Patricia. Because it's, it's a debatable topic that a lot of people are talking about, especially when they look at other guys that could have been brought here, a la Devin Bush, Greedy Williams. Some people are debating and saying, those guys would not fit here. But you know what? When you look at it, it's obvious there were more talented guys that could have been brought here. But Bob Quinn's not willing to do that. I think he's going to be somebody that's strong in his convictions. But at the same time, is he doing it at the detriment of the Lions? 
Yeah. I mean, personally, I've always been a, you know, take the talent and figure it out later guy, but I'm also sitting here. It's easy to do that from, the, from this position. I'm not an NFL uh, GM trying to work with a head coach. I mean, I think it's interesting because Matt Patricia, um, when he talks about scheme and when he talks about system, uh, I think it's interesting because he'll, he'll say like, you know, at the end of the day, you, the best scheme in the world doesn't matter if you don't have the players who can, you know, work the fundamentals and work the technique and everything. So um, I, I think sometimes it gets overblown this idea that they need like these very, very specific guys to fit, but then at the same time they turn around and they, they say that themselves. So it's kind of a confusing, uh, it's kind of a confusing contrast at times. And, and it goes back, like you mentioned, Bush, um, would have covered up a lot of weaknesses at the linebacking spot. And Ed Oliver, to me, is a, was a top five player in this class and has a chance to be a double digit sack guy. And like he's, he could be dominant inside. So that's tough to pass up on those guys. And that's not to knock TJ Hawkinson. I think TJ Hawkinson is a really good all around player. I think he could be a really good pass catcher in the NFL, but you know, it, it, it's, it is tough to sort of pass those, guys with elite traits uh to just try and plug holes uh in this specific scheme but uh, again it sort of goes back to my original point like if you believe in this scheme and in this coaching staff i I think they had a really good draft but you've got to see those results too like if matt patricia is going to be drafting you know if they go to the draft and say all right we have three linebackers that really make sense for us and they take one of them into buy then that guy's got to be what you think he is. You know, he can't be the fifth linebacker who's maybe on the active roster every week. He's got to be playing, you know, 50, 60, 70% of the snaps and really making an impact. So uh, this is um, this is sort of a litmus test draft, I think. Last year was a little scattered because of the timing with Matt Patricia coming in. They were still making the transition from Caldwell to Patricia. This year, everything's pretty much in place. And I think that we're going to find out a lot about sort of the progress uh, of this franchise under the the Quinn Patricia regime based off what happens with this class. Chris, did the Lions miss out on not adding a guard or a tackle in this draft? Yeah, I mean, that's I think they did. I mean, it looks like they did. Um, I, I will say I do think I really get the sense that they are pretty high on Ode Abushi for better or worse. Um you know, that's a guy who's never really been a full-time starter necessarily in the NFL, but he was with Daryl Bevel in Seattle uh, in 2017. Um, Matt Patricia really likes his uh, toughness and, again, the, the versatility. So uh, I think if you were to start the season right now, he'd probably be your starter. Nobody really jumps off the page there, though, uh, and that's going to be a pretty wide-open competition. I mean, I think they'll probably add another guy or two, whether it's off waivers or a trade or however. But yeah, I mean, I, and I think the one reason that it's surprising they didn't pick one is because it was a really, it was a deep draft in a lot of ways uh, for those interior linemen the guard, and the tackles too, to some extent. And they had a bunch of picks on day three. So I think it just sort of naturally set up for them to pick an offensive lineman, even if it was kind of a developmental offensive lineman at some point. And, uh, you know, they, they plugged those holes a little bit with a couple of undrafted guys um, that they went out and got, but. Yeah, I was surprised. I thought for sure that was a position that they were going to address uh, somewhere in those middle rounds. And I don't know if you read that they didn't as a miss or as them being higher than everyone else's on the guys that they already have. With everything that happened after the draft, which undrafted free agent are you most intrigued by or do you think has the best shot to to make the team? Now, they did go out and, and add a whole bunch of uh, offensive tackles or, or offensive a lineman per se which one has the 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 best shot in your estimation to make this team or at least makes you say hey this guy's most intriguing yeah i mean i don't i think it's pretty easy for me and that it's bo benchwell the wisconsin guard for all the reasons we were just talking about and also because you know he's coming out of a program where he you know you know those guys can at least at the very least be serviceable offensive linemen and probably help you in the run game i mean there are reasons certainly that he went undrafted but he's got experience he played at the senior bowl like all these things they really like and it's a spot where um it could be wide open uh so i think that that's really the one that you circle and ryan pope because they paid him so much money to could come in and compete as a backup tackle um 
the one I think that people will be watching and it probably will be fun to watch here, assuming he sticks around for a while, is Donald Parham, the 6'8". I mean, technically, he's a tight end. I don't know how much actual tight end, you know, inline tight end he'd be playing. Uh, uh, he looks to me like, you know, one of those guys like Tail Redding last year that comes out and makes a ton of great catches in camp and everyone sort of says, oh, maybe maybe we got something here. And then he kind of wait and see if the team feels the same way. But he's he's really intriguing because of the height and uh, he's got really good speed. So uh, that's one that if they're looking for a number three, number four tight end, maybe you stash him on the roster and see if you can find a spot for him. Now, before we let you go, and thank you so much for joining us on our celebratory episode 300 of the Doc and Jock podcast, uh, how are things going at The Athletic? One of the reasons why Adam and I love reading The Athletic is the behind-the-scenes features, like taking you through a day in the life of one of the staffers there at the Lions. What kind of things are you interested in currently? What maybe can we look forward to? Because uh, for me, obviously, I would love to know what it's like to be Bob Quinn for a day, maybe showing up <laughs> at Allen Park for like maybe at 550 in the morning and leaving at 12 at night but i know the the great work that you guys are doing what's interesting you right now yeah that would be uh great if they let me <laughs> go tag along like that and i got they get, get, get some access this off season you know took the trip to uh alabama with matt patricia for a coaching clinic like they, they've been uh sort of gradually opening up the doors a little so hopefully that continues i mean i think you're right i think a lot of that behind the scenes stuff not just bob quinn um, but like I talked to uh, Kyle O'Brien, their VP of player personnel, just sat down with him for a half hour. Like, I think some of that stuff is interesting. I mean, I think moving forward, what um, I'd like to stay on top of as much as possible is just sort of how this next process happens, because Bob Quinn likes to churn over the bottom of his roster about as much as any GM in the league. And so uh, just to get some better idea for, you know, how they go about scouting these guys once camps are going on, once the preseason's going on, I think that's uh, that's something that'll be interesting to watch moving forward. Um, and then you know you get into once you get into the off season program a little bit more here, I think that that's just sort of uh, takes care of itself to some extent. You know, carrying camp and then probably some joint practices and everything like that. So keep working on uh, getting some of those behind the scenes access for an organization that doesn't technically or doesn't typically let uh, a lot of people behind those doors, but um, yeah, exactly. a little more open. But yeah, exactly. Hopefully it'll keep going. Yeah, exactly. So for this question, I'm in search of kind of some relatability. In our situation, obviously, you know, we're a podcast, but obviously you've heard of us and we've been around now since 2013. So obviously we're sending emails to important people, but, you know, at the stage where things are declined, I, I guess I'll ask for you is, do you, when you ask for stuff, do they just not reply or they say it's not available for us? We're at the level where we ask, we ask a lot, but we just don't get really a reply. So I'm okay with that because we've been, we've gotten told yes a lot, but I'm wondering in your case, because obviously you have a great job to do, do you just get ignored or you say maybe, or how does that work for you? The the PR staff is, is pretty good over there now um, in general. I, I mean, I do get a lot, there are a lot of maybes or a lot of we'll try and, you know, see what we can do or how we can hook this up. And sometimes they pan out and sometimes. Okay. So our next goal is, our next goal is to get the, we'll try. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I'm not, I'm certainly not batting a thousand, but um I'm betting no, zero. I, I'm betting zero. So I, I'm working on it. <laughs> I'll see if I can put in a good word for you guys. <laughs> Thank you. I'm in the building and, uh, uh, see if we can get you hooked up with some of the stuff you need. Yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, I think it's sort of, it's definitely better. Um, it feels better so far than it did the last, going into the last mini camps and all, OTAs and all that. So hopefully, yeah, you know, that the, there's a little more transparency, I guess, from, from the top down with this organization going forward. Because I think the hard thing, uh, and certainly you guys would be able to speak to this, but like, I think it, I think the tough thing for fans is that they really want to get, fully invested in every single thing that goes on with this organization. And it's a little tough because the organization at times has been not necessarily like, you know, the Detroit versus everyone. It's been like this building versus everyone and even like locking out, you know, the fans who want to be involved and want to be a part of it. So I think it's been good to see them um, try to take some steps to remedy that. And again, hopefully it keeps moving forward. And like I said, we'll get, see what we can do to get, uh, get you guys some better access this year. I don't know how much I can help, but... Uh, oh, no, don't... Uh, no, no, shot. Chris, thank you so much. <laughs> Just you saying that means a lot to us. Oh, don't worry. We're emailing. We got our staff emailing, and uh, we got the potential of covering uh, a training camp in August. And I think that for us, they just, yeah, we have to prove our mettle. But I always like it when... Um, 
uh, we send stuff out and you just don't get a reply. I'm, I'm, I'm all for no's. I'm all for heck no, never going to happen. I'm all for denials. I'm just, it's, I find it fascinating personally, the ignoring, the, the, like I didn't email, like I'm not going to email again. <laughs> so I find it funny and uh, I'm glad that we have friends like you uh, working at The Athletic that will come on and share insights. And we look forward to talking again. Uh, talking about the Detroit Lions, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, we're all going to follow, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, friend of Doc and Jock, Chris Burke, keep on with the great work over there at The Athletic we're reading. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate it. Yep, we'll talk soon. Thanks, Chris. That was Chris Burke. Let's take a quick time out because I think you and I both are looking a little tired at the moment. Let's take a quick two-minute break and come right back. That would be hammered. <laughs> You're listening to Doc and Jock on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Adam, I want to tell you about our host site, Podomatic.com. We've been lucky to broadcast since 2013 because we have a great host site. When you're starting a brand new project, you need a place to host all of your audio, all of your great interviews. And if you have a bad one, one that cuts out, or if all of your listeners can't access it, you're dead in the water. You can't grow. You can't add other shows to your network. You got to have a great host site. And we're working with a great one, Podomatic.com. So if you're looking to start a brand new podcast, a brand new project, Doc and Jock and all the hosts here on the network, we're going to recommend one host site and one host site alone, Podomatic.com. So every year after the Lions draft, we react to it. And I think everybody has been a little bit skeptical. Now, there's some that are undying Lions fan, those that say, hey, you haven't seen anybody yet practice. You haven't seen anybody. How can you make judgments? But look, we're having drinks. We're not going to just go, hey, what do you think of those guys? What do you think of the Lions draft? Let's wait three years. Well, if you're one of those guys, well, we went back on our Twitter page and we regraded one of the drafts. I looked at that draft when I did it, and you can go find it at Detroit Podcast. I said to myself, Damn, bro, there's nobody left on the roster that the Lions took, and you can't even grade it. And I think that's why a lot of people react so strongly. People are wondering, why do the fans jump on every pick? Because the fans of Detroit deserve a winner, and they realize that they have to be critical with the Lions because they haven't given us anything. And so you do the hard work. You look at it. You're a guy in the know. You do your research. You scour the Internet, ESPN, Bleacher Report, Sports Illustrated. You know what you're looking for. And you, every year, you say, you know what? I'm going to do the work. I'm going to take the time and redraft for the Lions. And I think that's good, too. Not only do we complain, we provide solutions. So this year, was the task hard? Was it difficult? Because I feel like you were in line with a lot of what Bob Quinn did in the later rounds, three through seven, which I think might show up in your redraft. I think the biggest thing, though, is the sexy picks, the money picks, rounds one and two, where all the best players are at. It seems like... Uh, Bob Quinn and the Lions just swing and whiff, whereas the work, when you got to evaluate talent, they do it decently in day three. It's just day one and two. We need to step it up. And if they can do that, then I think a lot of the fans will be happy. But in your situation, what happened? Who are you redrafting? What does your new draft look like? And how did it shake out? Well, I'm glad you proposed this question. And this is something that you and I had discussed. And this is something that, that we tend to do quite often. Not just on the podcast, but just sitting around having drinks. And I have a question for you because I went a little bit crazy with this. I went a little bit nuts. Making trades, making moves, stuff like that. Yeah. So on this edition, do you want, and this is really up to you. I'm going to put the ball in your court and you're going to tell me what you want because I have three or four of these redrafts that I Three or four. Okay, here's what we'll do. One of them put on the website, and one tell me that you think is the best option that would have gotten the Lions for sure into the postseason or at least Mm. competing for a division title and some success, more than the 6-7 wins that Vegas is projecting. Because after the draft, most people are giving it a C, D. They're not happy. Uh, the, the, the odds in Vegas are the fifth worst in terms of win total. Nobody's happy. You can make a lot of money if you bet the Lions not to make the postseason in 2019. And I just think it's a challenge because, yeah, they got better, but I don't think they got as good as what the rest of the division already has and what the NFC can present in terms of talent. So I just think it's another season where they're not going to make the postseason. Maybe in the neighborhood of 7-8 wins, it'll look better, but I don't think they're good enough just yet based on what they drafted. All right. So 
if you're gonna if you're gonna do it that way, I'm gonna go with in the first round. All right, eight overall. They're not taking TJ. No, 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 no. God no. <laughs> God no. I don't think any of my any of my redrafts I have TJ. No, TJ's not even not even an option. <laughs> Which I don't know what that says about Bob Quinn, but I, I don't know. Maybe it says more about me. I'm not really sure. But I'm gonna take linebacker Devin Bush out of Michigan, and then I'm gonna follow that up at pick uh, number eleven or 43 overall in the second round with Irv Smith. Then I'll come back in the third round at pick 81. And mind you, this is the Lions. They ended up trading up to get this pick. I'm going to take Connor McGovern out of Penn State. Now, all that being said, the Lions didn't have to trade up to get this pick. They could have waited, and you'll see that in one of my later redrafts. I, I did a couple different things in these redrafts, and it'll be up on the website. You can go check that out. Uh, Connor McGovern out of Penn State. So now you address your guard position. And I think guard is a, a huge hole in this point and this team right now. Rounds four and five, I'm totally cool with, right? Austin Bryant out of Clemson and Armani Ojuare out of Penn State. I think Ojuare might be the best pick the Lions have in this draft. He really might be. He has a, a, a chance to step in and start right away. He has a real chance to to start opposite of Darius Slay. He is a very complete player, as well as Austin Bryant. Austin Bryant's the DN out of uh, out of Clemson. I feel like he may have fell a little bit. He did rip his pectoral muscle and ended up playing the last four or five games with a ripped pectoral muscle. And the guy still showed up and did great things. Now it gets a little bit weird and a little bit different for me in round six. All right. Running back is an issue on this team. It's, I don't know, you you need to bolster that position. You do. So Dexter Williams, they're out of Notre Dame. You could have picked him up. And you put, pick, could have picked up Kelvin Harmon out of NC State. And I think both those guys would step in. Dexter Williams would totally solidify that running back two position for you. And Kelvin Harmon would then step in and give you that big body slot receiver that this team is looking for. Do we know who's playing the slot right now? Not really sure. It, it, you know, it, it could be Danny Amendola. Could not be. I don't know. It's Danny Amendola. Tends to get hurt. Who knows? And then in the seventh round, I look at uh, I look at just kind of bolstering the defense. And I take Jimmy Moreland, who is a cornerback out of James Madison. He's a guy who's got speed. He's a guy who has the ability to make interceptions. He has the the ability to take those interceptions back to the house. Jimmy Moreland is a guy who will probably spend most of his time on special teams. I come back with my last pick, and I like what they did. I like P.J. Johnson. P.J. Johnson looks to be a guy who can step in and be Snacks Harrison. Like, he might legitimately be Snacks Harrison after Snacks Harrison moves on or after... You know, they get done with Snacks Harrison, and that sounds pretty pretty coarse, and I'm sorry about that, but that's how this game is played. P.J. Johnson might be the guy. You might get some value out of that seventh round by picking up P.J. Harrison and plugging him in. So that's my redraft. I, I'm definitely not going in, in any of my redrafts, not one of them. I'm looking through all of them right now. Not one of them. Did I ever go, did I ever go with, at Al- or without with, with TJ Hawkinson. It was either yeah. Ed Oliver or it was Devin Bush. And then if we traded back, if we got really froggy and we traded back with Pittsburgh because that was an option, it, it was probably Byron Murphy out of Washington. So you solidified that cornerback position. And still, people want to talk about that secondary or that tight end. I'm still taking that tight end with Irv Smith. And, and you know, let's do this because I wasn't sure what we would do here. I just, you know. It's the 300th episode. We yeah. do whatever we want. I'm feeling froggy, and the drinks are kicking in now. So why the hell not, right? Sure. So let's do this. So at 20, all right, you take Byron Murphy out of Washington, all right? At 43, you're going to take Irv Smith. Now you have an extra second-round pick. You got that in that trade from, uh, from Pittsburgh. You're going to take Paris Campbell, all right? It's a speedster. Guy's going to move in, play your slot, probably. Uh, you're going to take Paris Campbell at uh, uh, 88. You're still taking Connor McGovern. 
So you're addressing your cornerback, you're addressing your tight end, you're addressing your wide receiver, you're addressing your guard position. You're addressing all these positions in your first three rounds. I don't know about you, but that sounds much better to me. Filled a lot of holes, a lot of guys. You could do a ton of things. Yeah, I think you did a good job on the redraft. I just think that in listening to Chris and following along with what you're saying, I think that there has to be this fine line and balance between talent and scheme fit. Because here's the thing. There's a lot of picks that you could say, you know what, maybe he fit the scheme. When you look at the tight end that they did select, Michael Roberts, and now you realize, oh boy, uh, Kittles over there in San Francisco is maybe one of those guys that could have been a legend. And he could have been a Detroit Lion. You look at that Tease Tabor pick and you go, ah, that was a stretch. Now, some of them have hit. You realize that Bob Quinn has done a decent job, but in certain areas in terms of unrestricted free agents and bringing in new talent, he's swung and missed on some and has gotten lucky on some. And you realize, okay, in order for the Lions to take that next step to become that franchise, that elite franchise, he's got to hit more. And that's the question that people are really struggling with is, can Bob Quinn hit more in terms of the talent that he's bringing here? And that's the biggest question is that most people are saying no, that when they look at this draft, they feel like the league has passed him by. Uh, Other teams are doing better. I mean, immediately after the pick of TJ Hawkinson, you got uh, Ed Oliver going to Buffalo. And right now, right then and there, people are like, oh, shoot. What's going to happen there? And then you realize what the Steelers do, and they go out there and select Devin Bush. The Patriots select Chase Winovich. And it's hard to shake that feeling that these guys are going to be legends and our guys aren't. And whether it's system, whether it's culture, they got to find a way. TJ Hawkinson has to be one of the elite players in order to change this narrative and start the process of getting the fans back on board because – You can talk about it all you want. You can say, hey, these guys fit and things like that. But when you go on the field and you go 6-10, and you wash away all the credibility with the pundits, with the fans. And that's why everyone's so critical is that, by and large, a lot of these picks haven't done enough to help this team win. And that's a big struggle because eventually, probably what's going to happen this year, uh, Roberts is going to get cut and probably Tease Tabor is going to be cut. And, And you can't keep swinging and whiffing on second round picks it's just not possible and so for the Detroit Lions to have success a lot of these guys that are taken kind of feel like projects and we're not down for that we're down for hey Chase Winovich probably could have been plug and play maybe he won't start all that much in New England but maybe here in Detroit he could have did a lot more but the perception is that a lot of these guys need work and uh look even people's scouting departments are really really professional um uh, the Boston College secondary player. I mean, there were concerns about the fact that quarterbacks picked on him. You know, I put it on our Twitter page and said, look, there are concerns with all the players. And I know that's what makes the job super tough. But we just got to keep our fingers crossed that the Lions hit on three, four of these guys and then add three, four new guys in free agency because they do got money to spend. So if they take a, a more conservative approach in the draft, but then hit home runs like they did, I think, with Trey Flowers, then you can say, okay, maybe this can be an 8, 9, 10 win team, and you're starting to build something. I think Martha Ford's going to give these guys a couple more years to get it right because it seems like with the guys they're drafting and who they're bringing in here, class guys and guys that aren't going to cause too much trouble, and if they produce in terms of coaching and Matt Patricia does his job, I think the Lions can handle their business and maybe get up and get up there and get up a couple playoff bursts back to back. Was your confidence shaken in Bob Quinn? No, no. Um, you're, you're, you're still confident I'm still, in, I, in this guy. I am a guy. He's going to be the guy who's going to take this. I'm fair. My, land. I'm fair minded. I think he's doing a good job in certain areas, but not good enough. That's right. the thing is that I, I I will grade him probably a C plus in that in your fourth year if you only had one playoff appearance and no playoff wins with Matthew Stafford. And in talking about it with others, I think the biggest mistake is signing Stafford to that deal. I think if he had the ability and the power, I think he wouldn't have done it. He could have got that position cheaper. You could have just let him go and realize, look, go succeed somewhere else. We can do this cheaper with a with a game manager, especially if you're thinking long term, you're going to bring in a Daryl Bevel and you're going to bring in guys that are going to um, help this roster in terms of coaching. I think that Stafford is not really needed, especially if he's going to throw the ball 18 to 20 times, right? So that's how I'm looking at it in terms of the Lions, and I'm proud of you for the redraft. I think it's good. Look for more stuff, too. I know you'll send it out, out, out there, a couple different versions maybe that we can talk about and debate, but I think the fascinating part with the Lions, each and every year that there's a draft, I think it's fair to be skeptical. I think it's fair to question. I think it's fair. These athletes know. Um, I think Jelani probably was a little bit surprised that he went that high. <laughs> you know, he's probably right. like, oh, wow, I got a lot to prove. But I think we should treat him fairly. We should really give him a chance. But at the same time, in pro sports, 
you have to also be aware that we're going to be com- comparing what you do versus other linebackers in this draft and TJ Hawkinson. We're going to compare. I mean, we know, we all know that Rob Gronkowski had damn near 17 touchdowns in his first two years. And if TJ Hawkinson can do that, or if he can be that premier blocker and not take penalties and not get you know blown away on the line, and he can actually do the job, then hey, we'll be satisfied. Oh man, it was fun to record this way. A little bit looser in terms of our uh, usual recording, but I think it was fun. I think it was good to celebrate a little bit and uh, have a good time with it and and uh, really keep this going. Episode 300 was fun. Oh, we celebrated. Oh, we celebrated. We think, celebrated. Yeah, yeah, we did hard work. And I think every once in a while you got to just take a step back, throw some back and say, holy cow, we created a network. We created uh, something that's viable. And look, I, look, I, I hate to see you know sites like Sports Illustrated go away, sites like ESPN the Magazine go away. But look, if they're not run properly, they won't be around. We're run properly, and I think our two brains together work well in terms of uh, what we're doing here, and we're going to be around for a while, at least for another year or so. That's what we're contractually obligated to. So, hey, we'll be around for another year, and uh, if, if if all the sponsors go away and are like, oh, these guys stink, we'll probably still do it because we're crazy. But in the end, it was fun recording these podcasts. Now, look, I think one of our fan favorites did decide to call the voicemail at 248-579-8686. Let's play it. Let's see who dialed us up, or let's see if it's just a wrong number. Somebody called the voicemail line, and I think I know who it is. Before all that, you guys can go check out all of my redrafts on the uh, on the website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. I've got a couple of them up there. Check those out. Let me know what you think. Also, interact with me. I'll interact with you. If you guys think they suck, let me know. All right, let's check out this voicemail. Hey, guys. It's Putty down in Florida. Just wanted to give you a quick call and say congrats on 300. Can't wait to listen to the show tomorrow. So glad way back in the day that I clicked that Detroit D logo and look where you are now. Um, love the show. Keeps me entertained every week and it's been awesome getting to know you guys and can't wait for uh, many more experiences in the future. Happy 300, bitches. Bye. Putty's a great guy. Love Putty. Knew he would dial in. 248-579-8686. You can dial in. You got about 90 seconds. Say whatever you need to say in any form. That's the best part of podcasting is we say what we want to say. We act how we want to act. And that's what makes this fun is that people come in here and are like, oh, my God, I, I love the platform. People come in here and are like, you know what? It's so free. You can talk for 30, 40 minutes, take a break whenever you need to. We're not bound by too many rules. And that's what makes this fun is that people who really enjoy broadcasting will like podcasting. I don't find too many flaws or too many weaknesses or, or too many cons of podcasting. And that's why we do it. And I just want to, again... Thank everybody for supporting us. We just dropped episode 300. We had a good time with it. One for the ages, one that will live on. And uh, I'm proud of the work that we're doing. And I'm proud of the fun that we're having. And uh, more success, more, more, more. That's all we're going to do. Like I said, I, the goal was to kick the door down. I created the venture. I created the opportunities. And that's what we're doing for me, my cousin, Vito, anybody that works with us. That's what we provide here, and that's what I, I love doing. And, hey, there's support for it. So it's uh, reinforced whenever you ask a, a kind of a, maybe a tough question like, should Blake Griffin be traded? And people are like, yes, no, no, yes. And they're back and forth, and uh, it makes it fun. If we were just sending it out there to crickets, it would not be as fun. So thanks again, everybody. Look, the, the one thing I hope you guys realize is we're real fans, real journalists here in town, and we have a platform to grow this in our own way, and we're grateful for that opportunity. And we'll talk again next week. You got another 300 in you, buddy? Heck yeah. Let's keep doing it, baby. Keep it going. You know this. Every Thursday, Doc and Jack. This was locker room talk. Second dick. Sorry, Detroit. <laughs> Didn't quite work out. And I, all I can say is Detroit Sports Podcast scores. I have voices in my head. They counsel me. They understand. They talk to me. Yeah.